Assalamu alaikum students. Welcome back to ENG 503. This is your prose 2 subject. And um, we started this subject with um, discussion and description of a travelogue that is titled Gulliver's Travels. And the writer is Jonathan Swift. And for those of you who have forgotten what um, we discussed in the earlier um, lectures, this is a travelogue to uh, remote nations of the world. And in this, the writer, at the same time that he describes um, people who are different from the people in England, takes an opportunity to try to reform the um, the royal family and the aristocracy of England by making remarks that are indirect. Since um, making direct remarks or making direct comments uh, is equal to high treason, and high treason is punishable by death. So uh, writers like Swift took it upon themselves to try to reform society by pointing out different um, weaknesses, different shortcomings in society. So Swift takes the help of this travelogue where he has um, a doctor uh, who um, goes on board a ship to serve as the ship's doctor. And the adventures that he encounters when the ship travels from one place to another. Um, he, in the course of his um, voyages, the ship is wrecked after a storm. And um, Gulliver finds himself on this island where the inhabitants are very, very small. To give you an idea of um, their smallness, the tallest would be six inches tall. Now, you and I would not say six inches tall. We would say six inches high. But um, that is uh, what um, the people of this island are like. The, the island is called Lilliput. And uh, Gulliver calls the inhabitants Lilliputians. So these Lilliputians, um, when they find uh, Gulliver um, sleeping on the shore, they tie him up. Um, and it is after uh, a lot of effort on Gulliver's part that um, a relationship is established. Gulliver starts to learn their language um, and he interacts with people um, from different classes in society. He interacts with the emperor and his court. Uh, he interacts with the common people also. Until such time as the Lilliputians feel comfortable with Gulliver, and um, Gulliver feels comfortable with the Lilliputians. It works both ways. So the emperor then decides to um, have Gulliver stay in his country um, and uh, provides food for him, which is something that's very difficult because compared to the Lilliputians, Gulliver eats a lot. In fact, um, the exact number that is um, decided upon is 1,742. And uh, because of his height and weight and uh, width, um, the, the scientists calculate that Gulliver eats equal to 1,742 Lilliputians. And therefore, they provide him food um, that is equal to so many, um, to the diet of so many people. So um, this becomes a strain on the treasury, but we'll discuss that later. What we have discussed so far is that Gulliver uh, saves the, um, the kingdom of Lilliput by um, bringing 
to Lilliput, the, the ships that were ready to invade Lilliput. And these ships are on an island called Blefuscu, which is, you can say, a sister island. And at the same time, there's great rivalry between the two kingdoms. Uh, and this rivalry becomes um, out of proportion when the uh, emperor of Blefuscu decides to invade Lilliput. So Gulliver prevents that by dragging 50 ships to Lilliput. But that is not enough for the emperor of Lilliput. And he says, you know, you could do the same with the rest of the fleet also. Uh, that is, bring all the other ships, the transports, to Lilliput. And Gulliver puts his foot down and he says, I will not enslave a free, brave, and strong people. So the emperor and Gulliver sort of have a little difference of opinion here. Uh, and those uh, noblemen and uh, courtiers who do not like Gulliver's presence in Lilliput, they make a big deal out of it and um, they try to uh, turn the emperor against uh, Gulliver so that the emperor will um, tell Gulliver to go away or will have him thrown off the island. So um, there is this little difference of opinion and a little stiffness that uh, comes between um, the emperor and Gulliver because Gulliver is not ready to um, bring the entire nation of Blefuscu under the, the, the domination of uh, the Lilliputians. The point at which we left off in the last lecture uh, was where um, Swift had started to discuss uh, Lilliput as a country and the Lilliputians as a nation. And in this chapter also, uh, which is chapter 6 of the first book, um, we're going to see what the Lilliputians are like, what their uh, concepts and values are like, what their traditions are. Um, and Gulliver is going to provide us with some detail as to that. So the first um, slide of the chapter always gives you an introduction to what Swift will discuss in that chapter. And the introduction to chapter 6 reads, of the inhabitants of Lilliput, their learning laws and customs, the manner of educating their children. Very important point. The author's way of living in that country, his vindication of a great lady. So these are the topics that um, Swift and therefore Gulliver will be discussing in chapter 6. And Gulliver says, although I intend to leave the description of this empire to a particular treatise, yet in the meantime I am content to gratify the curious reader with some general ideas. So he's going to tell us a little about uh, Lilliput and the Lilliputians and their customs and traditions. As the common size of the natives is somewhat under six inches high, so there is an exact proportion in all other animals as well as plants and trees. And he's going to tell you what the proportion is like. If the tallest inhabitant is six inches, um, then all the other animals are going to be uh, proportionate to that. So he says the tallest horses and oxen are between 4 and 5 inches in height. The sheep an inch and a half. So the sheep are about this size. You wouldn't really think that sheep could be this size. But taken in conjunction with the fact that the tallest of the Lilliputians are 6 inches high, um, sheep that are an inch and a half high, um, is not very surprising. So the geese are about the size of a sparrow 
and so on and so forth um, until they come to the smallest which he says to me is invisible. Now you have to remember that while Gulliver can see far, he cannot see the tiny things. The Lilliputians, as he explains, can see the tiny things because they are proportionate to their own heights, but they cannot see far. So as he says, they see with great exactness, but at no great distance. They can't see as far as Gulliver can. For one thing, Gulliver has height. So Gulliver can see, uh, let's say, right up to Blefuscu. But the Lilliputians cannot because they are small in size. So they can see only at a distance that is proportionate to um, their heights. And to show the sharpness of their sight towards objects that are near, I have been much pleased when observing a cook pulling a lark. Now, this is a bird um, that the cook would be using to roast, um, probably for a nobleman's or even the emperor's meal. Uh, and pulling a lark is removing the feathers the way you do um, with chicken because chicken is the most commonly consumed um, fowl in uh, Pakistan so I'm giving you that reference the way you see uh, a butcher um, pulling the feathers out of a chicken the same technique is adopted for all other fowl. So he's talking about a lark. Um, the irony is that the lark is a bird that is known for the sweetness of its voice. But when it comes to um, the nobility, the aristocracy, they will eat anything without regard for uh, what other purpose this animal or this bird could serve. So for the king, for the nobleman, it is not very strange to eat animals and fowl which can be used for something else. So um, the example that he's giving is that uh, I saw a cook um, removing the feathers of a lark for cooking and the lark appeared to me to be the size of a common fly. So you see the, the proportion um, of um, the bird with the height of the Lilliputian cook and with Gulliver. For Gulliver, the bird is as um, small as a fly. But for the cook, it's a bird that can be cooked and therefore served. And then he also gives the example of a girl threading an invisible needle with invisible silk. So a needle for the Lilliputians would be something that Gulliver wouldn't be able to see. He might be able to see far, but he cannot see the small objects. Needles are very fine objects. And the thread that is used for a needle is finer than the needle. So for Gulliver, it is invisible needle and invisible thread. The tallest trees are about seven feet high. Does anyone know how high our tallest trees are? 20 feet, 30 feet, or maybe higher than that, especially in the mountainous um, areas. But with the Lilliputians, the tallest trees are seven feet high. And he says, that these are trees that are in the great royal park and these are trees that if I put my arm up, if I stretch my arm uh, with a closed fit, fist, I can touch the tallest trees. So the tallest trees for the Lilliputians are not the tallest trees for Gulliver. The other vegetables are in the same proportion but this I leave to the reader's imagination. So you can imagine what other things 
uh, are there and how small they are because Gulliver is comparing them to his own um, height as well as to the size of the lily passions. So he says, I'm not going to say much about their learning, uh, which has flourished in all its branches. The um, lily passions are a learned people. They are scholarly. Um, they have done a lot of research. But their manner of writing is what he's going to focus on. And he says the manner of writing is very peculiar. And the reason is it's not left to write like the Europeans, like you write English, nor from the right to the left like the Arabians or like we write Urdu. We write Urdu from right to left. English is written from left to right, nor from up to down like Chinese. The Chinese characters uh, are start from the top of the page and then they go down. But he says that the lily passions write from one corner of the paper to the other. And here you see uh, Gulliver's and therefore Swift's sarcasm because he says like ladies in England. A very, very sharp jab at the ladies who do not know how to write neatly and how to write in a line. So they write a slant. They start from um, the top left-hand corner of the page and the sentence is going to end at the bottom right-hand corner of the page. I can't write on an unlined paper. If you give somebody like me unlined paper, I'm probably going to be like Swift ladies of England. I'll start writing from the left uh, corner top left corner and probably go right down to um, the opposite corner. Anyway, so he says that the ladies in England uh, write like this. They do not know how to write neatly and how to write in straight lines. And he compares the lily passions to the ladies in England. And then another interesting thing that he talks about is burial um, traditions and burial practices and he says that they bury their dead head downward because they believe that in 11,000 moons they will all rise again. Um, there's the Christian concept of the day of judgment. There is the concept in Islam of uh, Qiyamat or the day of judgment and um, it is believed that all the dead will rise again. So he says that the lily Persians believe that in 11,000 moons, that is 11,000 months, this world will come to an end, all of them will rise and because the world, the earth will have turned upside down. Those who have been buried head downwards will stand upright. Do you get that idea? You bury them head downward. This is the earth. The earth turns over and so you're standing straight up. What he doesn't take into account is the fact that then the earth is above you. I don't know how Swift made that up, but anyway, that is how he says the lily passions um, bury the dead. And he says it, it sounds ridiculous, it sounds strange, but this is what they believe and you cannot do anything with beliefs. And he's pointing out here to some beliefs held by Christians um, which he thought were very strange and difficult to believe. And then he comes on to the laws and customs and uh, he says that they are very different from those of my own dear country, that is England. So um, the only thing that he wants to say about laws and customs is that they are very well executed. 
those laws are implemented they're not just there on the paper they are actually put in place and they are observed and very strictly adhered to the first law refers to informers people who um, who say so and so did this or I saw so and so doing this all crimes against the state are punished with the utmost severity but if the person accused makes his innocence plainly to appear upon his trial the accuser is immediately put to an ignominious death so the accuser will think twice thrice ten times before accusing anyone of a crime you can't say I saw so and so stealing so and so's purse if that person can prove that he is innocent then you will be put to death and it's a very shameful death that um, that waits you if your accusation is proved false and not just that it's not just that that the accuser is killed but out of his land and goods the innocent person is given four times for the loss of his time for the danger he underwent for the hardship of his imprisonment and for all the charges he has been at in making his defense so that whatever he has spent whatever he might have earned the state takes four times that money from the accuser and gives it to the innocent party and if um, the accuser does not have that much money then the state will do it the crown will do it so very strange laws uh, but as uh, Swift says these are laws that are implemented very strongly um, and that they are executed the customs are observed the emperor also confers on him some public mark of his favor so that if a person is proved innocent he is given the benefit of that innocence and everybody tries to make amends for um, whatever wrong has been done to him even the king will make a special mention and say you know so and so was accused of doing this but he has been proved innocent and the person is wonderful and proclamation is made of his innocence throughout the city so people go around announcing that so and so is innocent of the crime they look upon fraud as a greater crime than theft because care and vigilance is what you need to take care and vigilance may preserve a man's goods from thieves but honesty has no defense against superior cunning so fraud is a more grievous crime a more heinous crime than theft you might prevent theft but you cannot prevent a person um, from, from, from showing his cunning and since it is necessary that there be a perpetual intercourse of buying and selling and dealing upon credit and that's where fraud comes and you know all these confidence tricksters um, all these uh, what do you call them uh, people who are known as double shah uh, men and women who say bring us your gold and jewelry and we'll double it and what happens is that uh, they give you artificial jewelry and they say that this is your gold that has been doubled and your jewelry your gold your money is taken away from them uh, and sometimes they will give you something to drink and uh, when you lose consciousness they will run away with all your money and all uh, the gold or jewelry so fraud is something that the lily passions are very very strict about and he says 
that um, they ho they hold that to be uh, a stronger or a, a, a worse crime than just theft and then he uh, mentions that he was once interceding with the emperor for a criminal who had wronged his master of a great sum of money uh, and when he um, told um, the emperor about uh, this he says well you know it was only a breach of trust the emperor thought it very strange that Gulliver should uh, sort of um, think of this as as unimportant and he says that this is the the, the uh, greatest aggravation that you can uh, give to a man to defraud him and uh, Gulliver says, I had little to say in return. I, I, there was nothing I could say because in my country, in my society, theft is higher than fraud. And people commit fraud all the time and yet um, they are not punished. But uh, the emperor was very surprised and he says, how can you take this lightly? You know, the person has made a breach of trust. And um, Gulliver then says, well, you know, uh, different countries have different customs, etc. So he just sort of uh, bides that time and he doesn't um, think that uh, it's something that he has to be uh, ashamed of. And then he comes to the concept of reward and punishment. And this is important because this is very, very different from what is practiced not just in England but in all the known world. Um, we have what we call reward and punishment but which is basically uh, punishment. All our laws are implemented um, by threats of punishment. He says um, that the the only place where I have seen this um, reward and punishment, uh, the, the reward and punishment being actually implemented is Lilliput. So what he's trying to say is that English law needs to be revised. Um, but we'll get to that in a little while. He says, in Lilliput, whoever can bring sufficient proof that he has observed the laws of his country for 73 moons and that's just a little over six years um, that person has a claim to certain privileges and um, he is given a proportionable sum of money out of a fund that is specifically for that use now that's something that is um, very strange for us because we do not reward people for doing good. We, we have the concept of punishment. If somebody commits a crime, we punish him. But for people who are honest and who do not commit crimes and who are innocent, there is no way that we have of rewarding them. In Lilliput, they not only give them money, but they give that person the title of Snilpal, um, or legal. Snell Paul means legal. So that person becomes a legal resident of that country and it's added to his name but this Snell Paul title does not pass on to posterity. In other words, each individual has to earn his own good name. Now this is a very sharp comment at the aristocracy and the nobility. In other words, the entire system that prevailed in England in Swift's time. So um, the, the Lily Passions think it very strange that in England they just have the concept of reward and not that of uh, punishment. And um, to go back to the previous slide, um, when Swift is talking about um, the uh, the adding of this title to the name, he is making a very sharp dig at the aristocracy which, um, which got everything, money, name, fame, uh, property, because of 
uh, being born in a certain family. It wasn't that they earned it, but it was there by virtue of inheritance. In Lilliput, he says, you have to earn your name. You have to earn the money uh, by being good, by being honest, by doing everything legally. Uh, but that is not so in England. So what he's trying to say is that this is the kind of uh, law that we need to have in England. Okay, so he says, and that is why justice is shown with six eyes. Two in front, two behind, one on each side. See the image of justice. Two eyes in front, two behind, one on each side to show that you are taking a holistic approach towards crime and towards the implementation of laws. And then the figure of justice has a bag of gold open in her right hand and a sheath sword in her left. The right is what is important. The reward is what is more important than the punishment in the left hand. So you see how um, he portrays um, in Lilliput the ideal of a country, the ideal in laws, in customs and traditions. So um, this is how Swift portrays Lilliput and Lilliputians. And then he goes on and he says, in choosing persons for all employments, and this is the selection criteria for employment, they have more regard to good morals than to great abilities. We talk about merit. For us, merit is n having the academic qualification, having the experience um, and the practical knowledge of the work. For example, um, if you hire uh, a cook for a big hotel, then you will need to see that um, the cook knows how to, to, to make a lot of different dishes. Um, the, the cook um, has the basics of hygiene uh, so that he doesn't you know, mix dirty stuff in the food and all that. But for the lily passions, the highest criterion is having good morals because they believe that the common size of human understanding is fitted to some station or other and that providence never intended to make the management of public affairs a mystery to be comprehended only by a few persons of sublime genius of which there seldom are three born in an age. Again, um, he is uh, he's commenting on the system of selection that was followed in England. The system of selection for the political parties, the system of selection for important posts like um, the, the Treasury, the Lord Chancellor, um, the, um, the, 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 the person in charge of uh, the, the defense forces, all these, he says, the practice in England is that you choose out of three. But in Lilliput, you choose the man who has the highest score or the highest record in morals. Not the way they do it in, in England and the rest of the world. Uh, and the reason is that um, they think that truth, justice, and temperaments are, temperance are in every man's power. Uh, and the, the practice of these virtues is what matters. They, these are um, 
these these are virtues that are within the range of uh, every human being and therefore um, proving yourself to be an honest person is not difficult at all so um, this is how the, the laws of Lilliput differ from the laws of England um, for, for them you know moral virtue is something that stands right at the top and all the other things are of secondary importance and they think that um, the person who is sitting at the top of uh, a department or um, a ministry uh, has to be of good models and you know there's a lot of sense in what Swift says uh, particularly when you keep in mind all those scandals that erupt about people in power they have the required academic qualification, they have the experience and yet when they get power they abuse it to the extent that, um, that a person uh, who has good morals would never do. So um, he, he goes on with uh, further definition and description of um, the criterion that is used by the lily patients to um, to select people who are going to head different organizations and then he says uh, in the same way the disbelief of a divine providence renders a man incapable of holding any public station so he says a man who doesn't believe in divine providence um, is is not going to be a virtuous man, he's not going to be honest, he's not going to be trustworthy um, uh, and that is why no um, importance or no uh, significant post should be given to such an individual and in Lilliput no post is given to people who are not of good uh, models. In relating these and other laws I would only be understood to mean the original institutions that is the institutions as they were originally created and not the most scandalous corruptions. Remember in the beginning he had told about um, the emperor uh, selecting people by um, seeing who can dance on the tightrope and the emperor holding out a stick and people either squeezing under that stick or jumping over that stick and Swift had said that this is the criteria that they hold for uh, employment to high post. He says that this is a corruption and this corruption was brought about um, by the, the grandfather of the present emperor so originally this was not so originally it was only men of uh, good morals who uh, were given employment in, um, in, in the top slots of different organizations, ministries, departments etc etc and when of course he discusses uh, the degeneration of these laws and customs he says that this happened because of the gradual increase of party and faction and then he comes on to ingratitude and he says ingratitude among them is a capital crime um, those of you who have studied King Lear uh, will know that Shakespeare also considers ingratitude to be um, to be a sin uh, and when um, in, in Lear uh, when, when Lear is portioning out his kingdom and he thinks that his youngest daughter Cordelia does not love him um, he, he, he is he's angry and he's upset and he's unhappy and he says my own child can be so ungrateful so um, th this 
that the Lili Paishans hold very strong opinions about ingratitude and for them ingratitude is a capital crime and the reason that ingratitude is held a capital crime he says is that whoever makes ill returns to his benefactor must needs be a common enemy to the rest of mankind for whom he has received no obligation and therefore such a man is not fit to live so it's a capital crime is punishable by death because if a person does good to you you are beholden to him and if you are ungrateful to a person who does good to you to a person who has done you a favor you cannot be trusted on to deal honestly and justly with the rest of mankind who has done nothing for you if you are ungrateful to a person who has done you favors then you cannot be trusted with the rest of mankind so very very strong beliefs um, the, the lily passions have and then he comes to something different and he says the notions relating to the duties of parents and children differ extremely from ours and you'll see a uh, swift looks ahead um, to the future when he describes the lily passions and how their children are educated he's, he's talking about um, a land where laws are very different from the laws customs and traditions of England and the Western world um, and one of the reasons that he uh, gives for parents not being trusted with the education of a child is that they say that uh, because men and women when they uh, when they plan a family they are not thinking of their responsibility they're not thinking of the children that they will bring into the world and therefore they cannot be trusted with the upbringing of a child so as he says they will never allow that a child is under any obligation to his father for begetting him so um, very very strong viewpoint um, the the recognized world uh, claims a lot of um, responsibility for the parents because they have brought the child into the world that is what uh, is thought in England that is what we people think that the parents the mother and father uh, make the ultimate decision on um, how the child will be brought up and um, how the child will be educated the lily passions he says do not believe that the mother and father are capable of bringing up their own children or the mother and father are responsible enough to um, take care of the education of the child so these are the reasons that the lily passions think that the parents are not to be trusted with the upbringing uh, of the children and he says that in every town you have public nurseries and what do the public nurseries do all parents except cottagers and laborers that is those who are working as farmers those who are working on the land um, do not send their children to the public nurseries all others have to um, send their infants of both sexes they are brought up in these public nurseries they are educated in those um, schools so they when they come to the age of 20 moons that's two and a half years 
um, two years and six months and they are sent to these public nurseries. You know, this is something that I find very strange. Um, Swift is writing what? In the 19th century? Um, the, the 18th and 19th century? And we are practicing this in the 21st century. When a child now is two years and six months, he is put in uh, a nursery, a kindergarten, and that is where he spends the whole day. You have daycare centers where you put a child who is only a few months old. He's talking about public nurseries where all people except laborers and farmers would send their children when they were two and a half years old. These schools are of different kinds, suited to different qualities and both sexes. And now he gives us details of how um, and to what time they are going to be kept in these public nurseries and public schools. So he's going to talk about the male nurseries first and then the female. Obviously, Swift is a man, so he's going to talk about male nurseries. So the male nurseries for um, noble or eminent uh, children or the, the, pa the, the children of uh, the nobility are sent to um, special nurseries. And again, this is a dig at the different schools um, that were set up for, uh, for the children, mainly the boys. Uh, belonging to the nobility. Um, schools like Eton and Harrow uh, where it took a lot of money to send your to your to send your son. So uh, in in the Lily Passion nurseries um, children of two and a half years are kept and they are provided with grave and learned professors and the deputies of the professors. So there would be a professor in charge and they would have other people to help him because they think that men of learning know more about what the child should know, what the child should have as education than the parents. So they are bred up in the principles of honor, justice, courage, modesty, clemency, religion, and love of their country. So all these virtues, they are taught in these public nurseries, and they are kept busy in work. They are busy all the time except for the time when they are eating and sleeping. So there's a lot of work that is to be done for these uh, male children. And um, you have, you don't have hours and hours that you can spend in eating or sleeping. You have very little time and out of the 24 hours, two hours are uh, fixed for what he calls diversions consisting of bodily exercises. So physical training, PT as you call it. Then they are dressed by men till four years of age. So till they are four, these male children who are sent to the public nurseries are dressed by men and although their quality be ever so great, um, so it doesn't make any difference uh, whose son you are, you are still dressed by men. And the woman attendant uh, are only allowed to work there or to dress them if they are above 50 and they perform only the most menial work. You know, the, the, the dirty work is what the women above 50 um, will perform in these uh, male public nurseries. They are never suffered to converse with servants so these male children do not talk with servants, but go together in smaller or greater numbers. So even when they are on 
um, on their so-called free time, that is their diversions, they are in the form of a group. They might be a small group, they might be in the form of a large group and always in the presence of a professor or one of his deputies. So somebody is always watching, always taking care of um, what they are doing, what they want. Somebody is always there. Again, um, what Swift is probably talking about is the children of the nobility uh, who were uh, brought up by servants and the parents never interacted with them. The parents never bothered to uh, spend any time with those children. And uh, he, he makes this very sharp comment here where, where, where he says that because um, they are always watched over by professors or their deputies, they avoid those early bad impressions of folly and vice to which our children are subject. So our children commit mistakes, our children become vicious, they become evil because they are brought up by parents. Whereas the Lilliputian children, because they are brought up by professors, they do not uh, become vicious and they do not commit mistakes. Their parents are suffered to see them only twice a year. Okay. So the visit is to last but an hour. Uh, they are allowed to kiss the child at meeting and parting. So no fondling, no saying, uh, oh my sweet boy, I've missed you so much. They're not allowed to say that because that would uh, make the child feel bad. It is just not allowed. And a professor is always there even at these meetings that the parents have um, twice a year. The pension from each family for the education and entertainment of a child is very important because that's where the money comes from. And if the family runs short of uh, money, the emperor's officers are there to exact payment. So it doesn't come for free. The family pays for the upbringing of the child and pays according to what it is told to pay. The nurseries of, for children of ordinary gentlemen, men, merchants, traders and hand, handicrafts are on the same pattern. The, the kind of work that they are um, given is the same as that practiced by uh, their parents and their grandparents. And the, uh, the difference is that these children are kept there until they turn 11. At 11 years, they are apprenticed to someone working in the same trade. So uh, a merchant's son would be apprenticed to a merchant, um, a person who makes handicrafts. His son would be apprenticed to uh, a man who makes handicrafts. So the difference is that the, the sons of noblemen um, stay in these schools till they are 15 years and the sons of traders and merchantmen um, stay in the school till they are 11. After that, they leave these nurseries and schools. So, uh, and then of course he makes a comparison and says their 15 years are 21 years for us. So. Uh, th there's a little confusion here on uh, time as it is meant for the lily passions and time as it is meant for um, for Swift or for Gulliver coming from England. So at 15 years, the uh, the male child of a nobleman is considered adult, mature. Um, this, the, the law in England says that uh, a male child is mature or becomes an adult at 21. And um, so the, um, the children of the Lilliputians, when they uh, leave these nurseries and public schools at 15, they are as mature as 
uh, Englishmen at 21 years. And, um, the fee and then he comes to the female nurseries and he says that the young girls of quality are educated much like the males. Only they are dressed by orderly servants of their own sex. So the only difference is that it is women who dress them. But even that is always in the presence of a professor or a deputy. So they do not um, allow uh, the children to be unsupervised. And um, whereas the male child is uh, dressed till the age of four, a female child is dressed to the age of five. And then, uh, of course, um, the kind of activities that are made up for the female children are never as physically, um, as physically taxing as um, the activities for the male children. And then he also makes a comment here and he says that uh, if some of the female servants uh, are foolish or are stupid and try to do what they are not allowed to do, then they are publicly whipped thrice about the city, a very extreme form of punishment, imprisoned for a year and banished for life to the most desolate part of the country. So very harsh punishment if these maids um, somehow mess up. Um, and of course the young ladies are as much ashamed of being cowards and fools as the men and despise all personal ornaments beyond decency and cleanliness. Neither did I perceive any difference in their education made by the difference of sex. So very important uh, point here when he talks about the lack of ornaments, the lack of jewelry um, in the Lilliputian women. And he's, you, you can see the underlying implication is that the, uh, the ladies in England wear too much jewelry. Uh, and uh, Swift is making uh, very sharp digs at the aristocracy and the nobility. Okay, um, so here you have uh, the difference between the male and the female um, education because the maxim is that a wife should always be a reasonable and agreeable companion should be reasonable and agreeable. They, they're not talking about beauty because they cannot always be young, so they must be reasonable and companionable. In other words, they must give uh, good company to uh, the men. And uh, then he goes on to marriage and he says, tw at 12 years, they are considered of marriageable age. Um, their parents or guardians take them home and uh, of course when they are parting there are a lot of uh, very teary scenes uh, and, and all the rest of it. So at 12 they are uh, married off and the same is true for um, the, the, the children of uh, merchants and traders or as he says females of the meaner sort they are uh, also sent as apprentices at seven years and those who come from noble families are kept till they are 11. The meaner families who have children at these nurseries are obliged besides their annual pension to return to the steward of the nursery a small monthly share of their getting. So whatever they're earning, they um, give a portion of that to the steward. And since they have to give this money to the steward, he says that the, the expenses of the parents are limited by the law. Again, this is something that Swift would like to see practiced in England where um, particularly the noblemen and the ladies spent a lot of money on their clothes, on their ornaments um, and on the parties that they threw. Now when you have a system like this in place there would be no um, uh, what he calls unreasonable expense. There would be no 
um, and no money being thrown away on parties or on elaborate dresses or jewelry etc etc and the reason is that the little passions think nothing can be more unjust than for people to bring children into the world and leave the burden of supporting them on the public so if you can't afford to have a child you don't have a child that is what um, Swift is trying to say here and he is making again a dig at um, the the lower classes of England where you had uh, large families and very few resources not enough money to to go around not enough money to feed and clothe the children um, and that is why those children then become a responsibility for the state the cottages and labor laborers keep the children at home their business being only to till and cultivate the earth and therefore their education is of little consequence to the public so they don't need to be educated um, which is a rather strange way of putting it because uh, of what what Swift is saying here is that the children of farmers will stay the children of will will stay the children of farmers will ultimately farm but they will not become uh, let's say educationists they will not become doctors or accountants or architects or engineers they will always be farmers the children of laborers will always be laborers they will never uh, have what is known as um, upward social mobility and here he brings in a diversion uh, and he goes off that track a little and um, starts to tell us how he lived uh, in Lilliput and um, he praises himself and he says because I was mechanically minded uh, as he says having a head mechanically turned and being likewise forced by necessity I had made for myself a table and chair convenient enough out of the largest tree in the Royal Park obviously um, he needed a table and a chair uh, of his own size not the size of the lily passions 200 seamstresses were employed to make me shirts and then he describes in detail how these shirts are made and at the end he says that um, when it when the shirt was displayed it appeared to be made of patches just as you have these patchwork quilts um, we have a lot of that towards uh, sin side it's called rally you know you have those pieces of cloth that are not used by anyone else and they pa they sew them together they stitch them together and they make this um, big quilt out of it so what they had to what these um, seamstresses had to do was um, put pieces of cloth together because he says that their linen is three inches wide so if this is the um, width of the material you are going to need many more widths in order to make a shirt and it's only three feet so um, three feet would be uh, what one yard you can't make a shirt out of one yard of cloth so um, th this is rather interesting detail that he gives on how they measure him they lie down on uh, Gulliver lies down on the ground and then they measure him from one end to another and uh, when they want to stitch a coat for him uh, they make him sit down and then they measure uh, the length of the coat and of course the the width the waist um, the hips the um, everything else that they cannot measure because of their size Gulliver measures himself and he gives them whatever uh, material um, he uses to to measure himself so they measure him round they measure his thumb they measure his wrist um, they have their own way of uh, measuring things 
300 tailors were employed to make his clothes. 200 seamstresses to make a shirt for him. 300 tailors to stitch his um, coat and pants. And then he had to take them off, stretch them out on the ground so that they could take all the different measurements. So um, th this is how he gets new clothes made. And then he says that 300 cooks supplied him w with food. And these cooks, they were reserved for his food. They were reserved for his service. And they had houses that were uh, close to Gulliver's. And um, he, Swift gives a lot of detail here uh, on how a hundred waiters attended to his um, to his wants. Some would um, roll up entire kegs of wine and water, and that was how they kept him supplied with food. So it was something. Uh, that was a very big issue because um, you have to remember that the Lilliputians being so short and small, everything in their kingdom was uh, proportionably small, um, but Gulliver had a big appetite. So um, it, it's something that, um, that became um, rather difficult for them, but they worked up a system whereby they would uh, bring food up to him, up to his table, and serve him there. And what Gulliver um, would do is that he would uh, pick up an animal that was roasted and put it straight into his mouth. And um, the people of Lilliput were very surprised um, and impressed by his appetite because they had not seen anyone like this before. Um, so very frequently you would have people who would want to see um, how Gulliver ate and drank. And um, they, they would come to, to him and um, they would say, okay, we want to watch you eat. Until a point where uh, Gulliver says that the emperor said that he would like to um, to dine with Gulliver, to in other words, to watch him eat. So the king came with his court, with his um, noblemen, and uh, he said that he wanted to watch Gulliver eat. So what uh, Gulliver did is that he picked them all up along with their chairs of state, put um, all of them up on the table so that they could watch him eat. Now, if you remember the previous uh, lecturers, we came across one character in Lilliput who does not like Gulliver and who's always trying to create trouble between the emperor and Gulliver. And this person is Flimnap who is the Lord High Treasurer. Now he's in charge of all the money, of all the gold, all the wealth. So it, it bothers him that so much of the money of the Lilliputians is going to feed and clothe Gulliver. And this is happening on a regular basis. Uh, and here also when the king uh, comes to watch Gulliver eat, um, yeah, Gulliver says that Flimnap um, was there and I observed that he often looked on me with a sour countenance which I would not seem to regard uh, but ate more than usual in honor to my dear country as well as to fill the court with admiration. So um, although Flimnap looked at him um, and uh, Flimnap never smiled at Gulliver, because the king had come to watch Gulliver eat, Gulliver says that it, I had to uphold um, the, the traditions of England. I was representing England in Lilliput. And therefore, I ate more than usual because after all, people are there, the emperor is there to watch me eating. So if I don't eat, 
then I'm going to disappoint the emperor and I don't want to do that. And uh, Gulliver also goes on to say that I have some private reasons to believe that this visit from his majesty gave Flimnap an opportunity of doing the ill offices to his master. In other words, what he does is he goes and he whispers in the ears of the emperor, um, your, your majesty, you know, we're spending a lot of money on uh, providing him with food. Why don't we throw him out? Why don't we tell him to get lost? and to go away from um, Lilliput because we're spending such a lot of money and the treasury is running out of money. So if we keep Gulliver here, very soon we will have no money for ourselves. As he says, uh, Gulliver had already cost uh, the emperor above a million and a half of sprugs. And he says that Sprogs is the greatest gold coin and it is for Gulliver as tiny as a spangle. It's very, very small. Okay. Um, and then Gulliver mentions something else and he says that, you know, the treasurer um, was so uh, somehow against me that he started a rumor, as he says, the malice of evil tongues, um, by spreading uh, by, by spreading news uh, regarding the Empress and Gulliver, and the news that he spread, the, the or the rumor that he spread, was that the Empress. Um, had taken a liking to Gulliver and in other words was having an affair with Gulliver. Now it's totally ridiculous if you come to think of it but um, Flimnap because he had never liked Gulliver he went around um, spreading this um, rumor and Gulliver in his defense said that yes the Empress visits me but it is never alone. Whenever she comes, she has her daughter with her, she has somebody else from the court with her, and uh, I always treat her with a lot of respect, but there's nothing going on. Um, and, uh, and so um, Gulliver, in doing this, manages to save the reputation of um, of uh, the Empress and um, in and he does this by saying that you know she's not the only one who comes to visit me there are other women who come I treat them all with the same amount of respect and on occasions when um, the Empress or some of the other ladies of the court visit him he says that a servant has to let me know in advance that so and so has come and when that happens I go to the door and I take up the coach and two horses in my hand and I place them on a table so that I can talk to them because if they are in their coach and horses and I am standing above them or even if I am sitting down, I cannot talk to them. I place them on the table so that we are on the same level. I will never be disrespectful. I will never dishonest um, with, with, with the women. I will always give them the highest of respects. And, and then he gives the example and he says, you know that there are times when I have more than one um, lady visiting me and uh, in, in such occasions what happens is that when I'm talking to one of the ladies um, the coachman of the other ladies would take them round the table you see for them this table is huge and so in their horse and carriage 
they move about and the one who's uh, who's talking to Gulliver only stays in front of Gulliver and he says that nobody has ever come um, to me alone except the secretary Relrisal and he came to me alone and incognito or disguised because he was sent by his majesty and he says that um, this is something that I would not have spent such a lot of time over if um, the reputation of the lady in question were not um, being spoiled so he says that uh, although I had been created an Ardek by that time uh, which the with the treasure of Limnap is not still I knew how to conduct myself um, and I would in no uh, way and at no time do anything that would be insulting to the presence of um, the emperor or the empress anything that would be considered an insult or even rude these false informations which I afterwards came to the knowledge of by an accident not proper to mention made the treasurer show his lady for some time an ill countenance and me a worse so for some time um, the treasurer um, was angry with um, Gulliver uh, and as he says I lost all credit with him uh, but um, Gulliver says I wasn't really interested uh, um, but the, um, the harm that um, Flimnap did was that he kept on pumping the emperor um, about what I had done and what I had said and all these were rumors that he had made up himself but because he wanted to be in the emperor's good books and he wanted um, the, uh, to have me thrown out so he spread all these rumors against me before I um, say Allah Hafiz today uh, let me quickly go through what we have uh, covered today what we did was chapter 6 of Gulliver's Travels and in this um, chapter um, Gulliver is explaining to us the different laws, customs, traditions of uh, Lilliput and amongst other things he says that ingratitude is a big crime um, and fraud is punishable by death fraud is held to be more reprehensible a worse crime than even theft and then he spends some time and space in discussing how children are brought up and how children are educated in Lilliput and what he's basically telling us is that the system in Lilliput is very different uh, from um, the system in England or in the rest of the world he's basically making a comparison between England and Lilliput and he shows Lilliput as an ideal place as a place where things are happening the way they should be happening so one of the things that he says is that um, the male and female children are not um, given in into the custody of their parents but they are taken away at two and a half years and they are put in public nurseries where they are trained under the supervision of a professor or the deputy the children are dressed by servants uh, and they are uh, they, they are given work to do they are never idle they're always doing something and then he gives us different categories of schools he tells us about the male nurseries and the female nurseries he tells us about the nurseries for the children of the nobility and he tells us about the children uh, of um, traders and merchants who have different nurseries 
and the different ages up to which they are kept there. And the one thing that you notice is that as far as the female children are concerned, uh, he says that they are taught to be reasonable and companionable because beauty is something um, that is physical and that is temporary but they are taught to be um, reasonable, they're taught to be um, very friendly and have all the social graces because they are basically going to be wives, wives and mothers. So what is emphasized is qualities that would be considered good uh, in a wife. Um, and that is the only difference that there is. Physically, he says, that um, the exercise that is given to the male children is slightly um, more um, exhausting or uh, more extensive than what is given to um, the female children. And then he goes on and tells us uh, about the amount of food that was allocated to him and how the emperor ordered um, that new clothes be made for him because by this time he'd been wearing the same clothes. Remember, he was shipwrecked and he didn't have any clothes. All he had was the clothes that he was wearing plus the hat. And uh, so they make new clothes for him. Um, there are a lot of people who interact with uh, Gulliver, but the one person who has never liked Gulliver is Flimnap. Um, who is um, the Lord High Treasurer and he constantly pumps the Emperor um, especially regarding the amount of food that uh, Gulliver is consuming and he's trying to turn the Emperor against him so that the Emperor throws Gulliver out of Lilliput and Flimnap can then again be the center of attention that he once was. I think that's enough for today. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Allah Hafiz.